you can hit pause if you've heard this one. Two guys walk into a bar, they're airplane guys. One says to the other, hey, how about this? We put a rocket in the baggage compartment of an airplane and then we tie a parachute to it. And if the pilot's about to crash or he gets scared, he can push a button and lower the whole thing to the ground. Who would do this? Who would believe it? Well, these two guys did. That's Alan and Dale Klapmeyer. This guy sold them the parachute. His name is Boris Popov. His company is called Ballistic Recovery Systems. And while you weren't looking or maybe thinking about it, this parachute system called the Cirrus Aircraft Parachute System, or CAPS, has been out there flying for 20 years. Yep, that long. But it's still enough of a novelty that if there's a camera around, and when is there not a camera around, the footage will make the evening news. Not quite up to Russian dash cam standards maybe, but eye-catching nonetheless. Now, I wouldn't say all pilots are egotistical jerks exactly, but we can be kind of funny, you know? Like somehow you're not a real pilot if you got to fly around with a parachute to pull your fat out of the fire. So when the Cirrus parachute system first appeared, the whisper campaign started right away. Like the first pole would be on the ground, or some kid would pull it by accident, or the airplane would land in power lines and blow up or worse, land in the middle of a Black Friday door buster. None of that happened, although one airplane got struck by lightning on the ground and puked the parachute out the back, and a couple have landed in power lines, but none blew up. Sometime around 1998, I stood in this place. It's the Cirrus factory in Duluth, Minnesota, and they were doing tests on the airframe by dropping it from the ceiling. Dale Klapmeyer told me two things I clearly remember. One, the parachute would be a wild ride and the people in the airplane would live but wouldn't escape injury. And two, the airplane would be trashed, never to fly again. Those things turned out to be true sometimes and sometimes not. So what has happened? Was the Cirrus parachute system just a clever sales gimmick or has it actually saved lives and made the airplane safer as it was intended to do? I'll get to the numbers in a minute. But first, let's talk about how this system works. The parachute and rocket extractor are mounted behind the baggage compartment. The system weighs about 80 pounds and the latest versions have a 55 foot round canopy. As parachutes go, that's pretty big. The activation lever is on the cabin ceiling and requires a 45 pound pull. That lights the rocket and that pulls the canopy out of the airplane inside its deployment bag. You can see that clearly in this footage shot by the Coast Guard of a Cirrus that had a fuel issue over the Pacific Ocean in 2015. In two seconds, the shroud lines are fully stretched. Then the canopy comes out of the deployment bag and begins to inflate. This skinny donut thing is called a slider and it slows the canopy inflation to reduce deployment loads. That's important because the parachute has to be made of light enough nylon to pack into a small volume and the slider slows things down so the air loads don't shred the parachute during opening. Initially the airplane is nose down but there are pyrotechnic fuses on what are called snub lines and they're designed to burn through and allow the airplane to assume a more upright attitude that spreads the impact load to the landing gear and the energy absorbing seats. As Dale Klapmeyer said, depending on the landing surface, the touchdown is no picnic. But it's not a train wreck either. The vertical descent speed under canopy is about 1,700 feet per minute or about 19 miles per hour. It's less than that if the parachute has horizontal component from drifting in the wind. Depending on the wind and sea state, a touchdown on water can be on the sporting side. This is probably the best video of an actual touchdown on grass with what appears to be no horizontal wind component. The pilot got a small cut on his head, but essentially both people were uninjured. CAPS did exactly what it was supposed to do. But overall, has the CAPS system really delivered? I dug back into our early reporting on the Cirrus starting in 1994 when the company touted the parachute, the 26G energy absorbing seats and structure, cabin flail space, and state-of-the-art avionics as safety items. Without actually saying it, 
Cirrus invited buyers to think they were getting the safest light airplane ever. Initially, it didn't work out that way. Cirrus had a rash of early fatal accidents, and when I analyzed the accident data in 2012, the Cirrus line had a fatal accident rate slightly higher than the general aviation average. Six years later, the Cirrus airplanes now have a fatal accident rate that's average or maybe even a little below the general aviation average. So what happened? Well, 2011 happened, for one thing. That year, 31 Cirrus airplanes had accidents. 16 of them were fatal, two on just one day in November. A little before that, the Cirrus Owners and Pilots Association, COPA, and specifically this guy, the association safety expert, Rick Beach, figured out something. Most of these fatal accidents could have been prevented if the pilots had just used a parachute. This accident near the Bahama Islands in 2012 got a lot of press, positive press, and it kind of iced the cake on the push to train pilots in the use of caps. The military had the same problem when ejection seats first appeared in the 1950s. Pilots just weren't used to analyzing how to use that get me out of this thing button, so they dug a bunch of smoking holes while sitting in perfectly good ejection seats. So let's bore into Captain Ego's noggin here to understand the nature of the problem. When the poop hits the fan, our man doesn't want to immediately admit defeat because he is, after all, the immortal clone of Chuck Yeager. So he tries to work the problem and fix it. Except maybe he gets a little task saturated, which is fancy psychobabble for his brain turning to quivering mush. Not only has he forgotten about the cap's handle a foot from his ear, he may be only vaguely aware he's in an airplane at all. Cirrus's dedicated caps training kind of installs another gear in the pilot's head that makes thinking about caps use part of the flight routine. For example, when climbing out after takeoff at 500 feet, the pilot verbalizes caps available to remind himself that the parachute is there. For other emergencies, say engine failures, turbulence, upsets, or loss of control, Cirrus now trains pilots to consider the parachute as the first option, not the last resort. Training also emphasizes that if you have any doubt about the survivability of the situation, use the parachute. Forget the stigma. It's better to go home at night with a good story than to ride your ego into a crater. The 500-foot call-out might suggest that the parachute can't be effective below that altitude, but Boris Popov, he's the guy who makes the parachute, says the better way to think about it is that the parachute can be used at any altitude and any speed, or at least speeds that aren't too fast. Cirrus gives the maximum demonstrated deployment speed as 133 to 140 knots, depending on the model. But the parachute has been successfully deployed at speeds much higher than that. Popoff says that even at very low altitudes, deploying the parachute will offer some drag and reduce the g-forces in a crash, even if it doesn't fully deploy. The Cirrus Owners Group tracks CAPS pulls carefully and currently lists 98 events. Of these, it claims 84 are saves, meaning lives were saved by using the parachute. I might quibble with that term saved because it implies that whatever emergency the pilot confronted could only have been resolved by the parachutes. That's not always true in the case of an engine failure or even a loss of control. In fact, in two cases, pilots pulled the parachute, but it failed to deploy properly and the pilots were forced to land trailing the malfunctioned parachute. Both did that safely. In a third incident, the rocket didn't fire at all after the pilot lost control in clouds, but the pilot regained control and landed in a field. It turned out to have been a fault in the handle cable mechanism. Quite a few caps poles have been at low altitudes, as low as 300 feet, and the pilot and passengers have survived, often uninjured. This much is true. When caps has been used within a realistic operating envelope, survival of the aircraft occupants has been 100%. In other words, nobody has died for having decided to use the CAPS parachute, even when it didn't work correctly. 
But that's not to say there haven't been fatal accidents. Copus data shows eight fatal crashes in which parachute use was attempted or may have been attempted. One was a California crash in which the airplane was flying well over 200 knots, far above the maximum deployment speed. Eight others appear to have occurred because deployment was attempted at altitudes so low the parachute just didn't have time to deploy fully. Injuries have occurred in CAPS landings, but at a rate lower than Cirrus may have initially expected. In those 84 saves, I counted 19 accidents with minor injuries and 10 with serious injuries. Those are small total numbers to calculate meaningful rates, but I call the probability of a minor injury about 1 in 4 and a major injury about 1 in 8. It should come as no surprise that parachutes aren't perfect and neither is capped. In this accident, for reasons that weren't clear, the airplane struck nose first, injuring all three people aboard. The NTSB called it a faulty deployment. These pictures were in the accident docket because the aircraft was in a planned practice formation flight. A quick thinking person in the wing airplane took the photos. Injuries aside, has CAPS actually lowered the Cirrus fatal accident rate? The available data suggests that it has although there are probably other factors. It took a while to get there. Take a look at this graph. The red line traces fatal accidents since 2001. The green line shows CAPS deployments. The lines cross after 2013. That's not just luck. As pilots were more aggressively trained to use CAPS, they used it, and inevitably, fewer of them died in crashes. Pretty simple math. Consider 2018 as just a single year of accidents. With more than 7,000 airplanes out there, the Cirrus fleet flies about a million hours a year. 2018 was a bad year for Cirrus accidents, 29 total, but only six were fatal. Copa counted 10 caps pulls in 2018. Would the number of fatals been twice as high without all those caps deployments? Hard to say for sure, but probably. Here's what the 2018 accident rate looks like with CAPS, and here's what it might have been without it. One last number here. That yellow line is the total number of Cirrus accidents. It has been trending upward recently, although fatal accidents remain low. The rising trend is somewhat of a mystery, but the theory is that as more Cirrus airplanes get older, they're cheaper to buy, and that expands ownership to more pilots who, being cheap, might not take the training. On the other hand, those accidents look less worrisome if you consider that as the Cirrus fleet grows, the accidents aren't increasing much. That's the same as a declining rate. To its credit, Cirrus offers these buyers of used airplanes free training under a program called Embark. It's free. How could it not be a good deal? And if you wanted to figure out how to use that parachute if you lose it in a Cirrus some dark and stormy night, it could save you from being just another dot on one of my annoying graphs. For AbWeb, I'm Paul Bertarelli. Thanks for watching. Oh, and uh, by the way, this isn't one of those weather channel clickers. It's the key fob for my truck.